talk um, came about because learning mainframe hacking is hard, obviously. And uh, we wanted to, a friend of mine uh, wanted to help me come up with a way to get this information across that was more fun than just me yelling at an audience for an hour. So welcome to Mainframe Hacker Choose Your Own Adventure. Uh, before we get started, uh, I need to have my disclaimer. So I'm not here representing my employer. I don't speak on their behalf for this presentation. This is all my own work and spare time, all my own research. Uh, okay, so who am I, right? So the world of mainframe hacking is a very small world. Um, I'm part of the, or I should say I'm a founding member of the Mainframe Hacker Society that is the world's largest collection, collective, basically, of mainframe hackers. There's eight of us total, uh, maybe nine now. And, and we share ideas, we share thoughts, we share scripts, we share all kinds of stuff. Um, I've spoken at all the big conferences on, uh, like in, in, InfoSec conferences, like RSA, share, like a RSA, DEF CON, Black Hat, you know, the big ones, except for the, you know, CCC, only because uh, I'm not going to Europe over Christmas because my family would kill me. Uh, I also run a class called Evil Mainframe. It's a mainframe pen testing class. We were supposed to teach it at Black Hat, but um, it doesn't really lend it. Like we bring an actual mainframe to the class and it doesn't really lend itself to teaching in a, in a non-personal uh, environment. So doing virtual is very hard with the, with the mainframe hacking class because we literally bring a mainframe in and destroy it. I also, so, so this is a fun thing. I literally just did this. So this is ANSI art from 16 colors. And I wrote a Python script that reads ANSI, converts it to 3270 using assembler. So it's a Python script that'll convert ANSI to the assembler you need to have this show up on your screen. Uh, it was a fun project. I learned a ton about 3270 and ANSI art and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so how's this talk gonna work? We're hoping that the lag isn't, isn't too much. So this is kind of an ex experiment. If it doesn't work, I'll just hop over to an NJE talk I have about network job entry, um, and you'll learn all the intricacies of network job entry on the mainframe. But if, if this works, I'm hoping it does, this would be a fun experience. So basically, the whole intent here is to learn mainframe hacking, to, to participate. So I am watching the, the Slack chat as we speak. So any comments? So, so thank you for the comment on the cover slide. I appreciate it. Uh, any comments, any questions, uh, free to, feel free to ask. The, all discussions are going to happen in, in the Slack on this channel. So I'm going to right now do a quick lag check because the way this works is you are presented with an option and then I have to wait to see how long it takes you to answer and then we get a couple of votes and then we choose that option. If there's one vote, that's fine. We'll still go on. If there's no votes, it doesn't really, you don't learn anything. So I'm going to stop now and please someone put the words mainframe in the Slack chat. Let's see if my, my wait music works. Here we go. Oh, that's not so bad. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. This will be totally doable. All right, good. So everything in this talk is going to be based on ZOS. I'm not talking about AS400s. I'm not talking about tandems. I'm not talking about ZVM. I'm only talking about ZOS. Uh, the key takeaway from this, I'm hoping the key take, so look, everyone knows about what happened like three months ago where a governor came on and said, oh, oh we don't have, um, we don't, we, we don't have enough COBOL programmers to fix our broken systems. Um, that's not mainframe's fault. Mainframes are modern, modern platforms. They literally came out with a new version. They're coming out with new versions all the time. It, it's, it's a very exciting space to be in today, in fact, but um, everyone thinks it's legacy and it's not legacy. You probably have older Windows boxes running on your environment than your mainframe is. So, all right, so that's, so the, the rest of the talk is, is about ZOS and there's some terminology you need to understand. So Rex is a scripting language used and installed, it's part of the core operating system. It is like, sort of like if Bash and Python had a kid with no objects. Okay, it's, it's a very powerful scripting language. You can make sockets. I actually wrote a, a interpreter in Rex 
So it's a very powerful scripting language and you can do all kinds of fun stuff on the mainframe with it. Uh, reverse shells, all kinds of things. Uh, Rack F, you'll hear us talk about Rack F. Rack F is the sort of like flagship security product that install, that's installed on every mainframe. Now, when I say install on every mainframe, there are, let's see how I, how I phrase this. There are two other security products you can install that will replace Rack F. One of them is top secret and one of them is ACF2. Both of those products are owned by Broadcom. You may come across an environment that has, broad, that has one of the Broadcom products, top secret ACF2. This talk's not gonna talk about that. We're just gonna talk about Rack F because Rack F is like north of 70% of the market, right? So chances are you'll encounter Rack F before you encounter top secret. And everything sort of translates. Like there's only so many ways you can fry a fish on the mainframe. And then JCL. So JCL is basically a scripting language for submitting jobs. So instead of you typing a command on your keyboard and running it interactively, you type up the commands you want to run and the files and everything it needs to run in JCL, and then you submit it. And every line in JCL is called a card. All right. Hopefully that's enough terminology. Here we go. I hope you're all ready for a mainframe adventure. So it is a random day and you get a phone call asking for help. Now the, the, the people who approach you, let's, let's assume they approach you over Twitter DM. They're very respected uh, media luminaries in the hacking sphere. And they know you know how to hack a mainframe and they don't. So they reach out to you to get your help on hacking a mainframe. And you tell them, of course, I will help you out. Oh, sorry, it wasn't uh, Twitter, it was WhatsApp. You tell them exactly what you need to hack a mainframe. You need MMAP, you need X3270 or C3270, and you need Python. That is literally all you need to hack a mainframe. I mean, if you have Git, makes things a little faster, but that's all you need to hack this mainframe. Nmap, 3270, and Python. That's it. Several days later. So that's it. So you communicate with them, and you don't hear from them for several days. They, they hit you up on WhatsApp. Now's the time to go. It's time to go. They give you a username, they give you a password, and they give you a bunch of Windows domain accounts that have been cracked on a paste bin link. And they give you a target. They tell you you need to target this IP address, 10.10.0.250, and we're going after a specific user. Target anything you can get for user play. Doesn't, it's not, you know, if you can own the platform, fine, but just go after this user. So of course, what do you do, right? So, you know, recon is, is key, king. So you write down the IP address, and you write down plague and you log in to your dump box. So you first, obviously you check the paste bin link that's available. Um, that link works if you, wanna, if you wanna try it out. I'll, I'll leave it up on the screen for a few seconds here so people can, can try to type it out in their address bar. But uh, you know, that's a text file with you know, a handful of accounts that you could use, but they're Windows accounts. They're not mainframe accounts. So who knows is that, if that's gonna be helpful or not. First thing you do from your jump box is you conduct an Nmap scan. This is a typical Nmap scan that you would see on a mainframe. It's got FTP running. It's got TN3270 running on three separate ports. This is, this is typical of what you would find in a mainframe environment. It's got an HTTP server running, Apache Tomcat, which is typical. And it's got only one of the three TN3270 sessions are encrypted, right? So you've got two that are unencrypted and one that, that's encrypted. So that, that's it from, from your MMAP scan. So now we have a choice. Do we want to look at Tomcat? Do we want to look at FTP? Or do we want to look at one of the 3270 things? And I'm going to wait for people to start posting in Slack about their choices.
I'll do it. A few more seconds. I see, I see one for FTP, one for Tomcat, and three for 3270. I'll get it. I, I, I don't see anyone's typing, typing. So it looks like we're doing 3270. So away we go. Let's start poking at 3270. TN 3270, the workhorse for your mainframes. We would need another vote for 3270. Okay, good. So it's weird, right? There's three ports running TN 3270. So, so we need to see what's running on those, those screens. So we use an MMAP script called TN3270 screen. And this comes with MMAP. You can just, if you, if you have MMAP now on Kali, TN3270 screen exists. So first we run it and we see on port 23, um, I guess this is Ellingson Mineral Corp and this is their mainframe environment uh, and some legalese that tells you a bunch of information. But, Okay, boring. If we, if we connect in, uh, it's exactly what we would see, just with color, right? So the NMAP, the NMAP scan, same thing if we connect in with our corporate, you know, our X3270, so, okay, fine. Next is port 992, so this is encrypted. I mean, NMAP even calls it Telnet S for some reason, but it's encrypted, it's the same thing. It's the exact same screen, Ellingson Middle Corp mainframe. Okay, so, so obviously one is for encrypted and everyone's supposed to use that and the other one's left for legacy reasons and they never shut it off. Okay, whatever. So fine, the last one is port 2323. And let's see, let's see if this is any different. Well, it takes you straight to Kix and it gives you a logical unit at the bottom of the screen called BSLVLU01. Okay, so if you noticed in the previous one here, we have a, a, an LU at the bottom right of the screen there, smog LU01. But now when we look at kicks, this kick screen, we get a different logical unit. So that's something to dig into. Okay, so what you're looking at when you've connected here is called VTAN. On port 992 and 23, if you type IBM test, you get a reply that's like IBM echo and then ABCD all the way through the alphabet through and then zero through nine. When you connect to an environment and, I, and you type IBM test like that in that 3270 session, you will see that you're in VTAN. And what does that mean? You can, you can explore. So you're now technically on an SNA network and you can explore the network by typing log on Apple ID something else or um, going log on app or just typing random application names that you think exist, TSO, Kix, whatever, right? Um, all kinds of things, NetView, right? You can try to guess application names. So that's VTAM. Now, when you connect to VTAM, you get a logical unit. Instead of taking you to VTAM on port 2323, instead of giving you just like the generic VTAM screen, it takes you straight to an application called Kix. Kix is basically the proto web server before, actually, I think I define it here anyways. So, so VTAM, so like I was saying, so VTAM, you pass it a command, log on Apple ID, whatever. It has to be eight characters. So log on Apple ID, less than eight characters, not eight characters. And if that application exists, your terminal is connected to that application ID and then you can do what you want to do. So say, for example, if you wanted to do kicks, and you knew that the application ID was, was Kix 2020, you would type log on Apple ID Kix 2020, and that would take you to Kix, right? Instead of connecting to port 2323. Okay, basically you have to think of it like you're guessing URLs on a web server to try to connect to some, some specific app running at various random directories, right? Similar thing here, or running a port scan. Basically you're doing, when you're doing like VTAM, you're, almost like doing a port scan in SNA. Not really, I'll get yelled at by mainframe la mainframers later, but for the junior audience here. So now we have a choice. Do we want to look at that random kick screen that takes us, that gives us an LU, that's weird, or do we want to take a look at VTAM, the other applications in VTAM? And I'll, hopefully the sound effects is coming across.
All right, I see a bunch of people typing LU. I got two votes for LU. I'll let it go. Maybe three, four more seconds. I know there's there's a big delay. Oh, and there's a thumbs up for LU. So I'm gonna assume that LU. Um, Randy, your comment. Assuming you're configuring in RackF to access the app, that's there's nothing that stops you from getting to the app, and it depends if they've implemented login. Like if if there's no requirement to log into an app, you don't have to log in, right? Like Kix, if you don't have any Kix security turned on, I can access all your Kix transactions through VTAM without question. So anyways, all right. So I guess LU wins here. I see four votes for LU. Let's let's do some LU testing, shall we? Let's see, my, well, there we go. LU application. So using the Nmap script, there's an Nmap script, again, comes with, with Nmap today, LU enum. You scan through the logical units that exist. So you're guessing logical units that exist. So you're assigned a logical unit, but you can actually tell the 3270 emulator which logical unit you want to use when you connect to 3270. Okay, so you run through this stuff um, and you notice that as you're running through these, like, so you, you go through B-sides LV LU01 through BS LV LU99 and at BS LV LU50, the application changes but it's just, just TSO. So here's, here's a whole bunch from MMAP is what your output looks like. And it looks like LU, BSLV LU57 is a valid credential. And it's just, so here, so we're gonna test one of those out here in, in our 3270 emulator to see you know, what, what's going on. So we're gonna connect to port 2323, but we're gonna give it an LU here specifically that we wanna connect to. So besides LU, LV, LU51, takes us straight to TSO. Instead of taking us to Kix like it did originally, now it takes us to TSO. It's interesting, but it's just TSO. Right? So it's not really that ground breaking of a finding. So, okay, so who cares? We're gonna move on to VTAM. So what we're gonna to try to do here is we're going to use a MMAP script called VTAM enum to enumerate all the application IDs. Now, knowing that you're in a corporate environment, before I start showing you the enumeration, knowing that you're in a corporate environment, you would typically look for LPAR names, Kix transaction ID names, Kix region names. Um, app, you would search application ID, or maybe you would search like 3270 help guide, and that will be on some SharePoint site, or you know. Uh, I'm trying to think of like a good like uh, Roomba instructions, right? And that would give you at least an application ID to try that you could build off of. Typically, they're going to be named TSO one through thirty-five, or um, TSO prod one. That, that's a character, or kicks one through twenty. Or there's all kinds of names, right? There, there's no specific name, but typically you can try to guess these things. You know, MBS ten would be like something you, MBS zero through ten like TSO, MBS, one through nine. There's all kinds of things. So anyway, so we try, we're just gonna run it with the default that MMAP comes with, and we're going to do a VTAM enumeration here. And actually there's a few others that we tested here. So we have three valid application IDs that we can now use to, to go after this, this environment. TSO, A06 TSO, and Kix52. So let's take, we're gonna take a look of each of these three. So first thing is gonna be, um, let's see, I'll probably TSO. So we're gonna look at TSO, okay, just TSO. And what is TSO? We're gonna find out in a bit. So it's just TSO, fine, that's good. Let's try A06 TSO, and it takes us to TSO. Okay, what a surprise. And last but not least, let's see what happens. Now, obviously, Kix TS52 is gonna take us to Kix. So here we go. So now we are in. So now we've explored all three of our of our options here. So like I said earlier, Kix is like a proto web server. Basically, um, there was a power company, and they wanted a way to have interactive screens that a that a person could interact with, that had design and templates and all that stuff. So you could you could do that kind of stuff. And when you connect to a region, think of that as a server. 
So if you connect to like Kix TS52, that's called a region. And it, the same thing, so say if you had like Apache running on port 80, you call that an Apache server. And then if you had it running on port, a different one running on port 8080, that would be a different Apache server. Kix regions are the same thing. You could have Kix TS51 and 52, and those are two separate regions that are running on the same main thing. On each Kix transaction is essentially like its own web page. It has a template called the BMS map, and then it has code behind it that does stuff to fill in the template or take user input from the template. It's, it's, it is wild reading like programming books for Kix, because it's talking about how, oh, you, ha you, you have sessions and you have to manage like, non-interactive users, and it's like, that's what the web has been for 30 years. Um, but they literally invented it before the web existed. And then TSO is called, it's called, it stands for time sharing option. And it's essentially the, the shell prompt for your mainframe environment. So if you connect into TSO, you are essentially as acting like an admin, you can run all kinds of commands, command line, you can access files, folders, all that kind of stuff. Okay, it's a shell. You want typically to get access to TSO, so you can do, you don't need it. If you can run JCL, JCL is even better than TSO. Um, if you know what you're doing. Most don't, so that's why we target TSO and of course like this. So again, where are we going now? Do we want to dig into Kix or do we want to dig into TSO? I'm, going to... I'm hoping the sound works. Okay, we got one vote for Kix. If I don't, if I don't get any more votes, I'm gonna we got one vote for kicks. Uh oh. TSO. Yeah, that's two vote for kicks. I think we're going to do. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad you can hear. Um, okay, so we got two votes for kicks and one vote. Oh, three votes for. Okay, good. So I hope, I hope, and there's not another vote for TSO. Too late. We're going for kicks. Let's take a look at kicks. You connect to Kix and you get presented with call, which is what called the good morning transaction. So you connect in and you get this. This is the good morning transaction when you connect into Kix. Okay, it's called CSGM. It doesn't do anything, it just sits there. Now we have a choice. Do we want to try to enumerate the transaction IDs to see if there's any that we can access without authentication or do we want to try the accounts that we have from Windows, the Windows domain, to see if they work in Kix? We got one, two, three votes, three votes for enum, one vote for boot. So we're gonna do enum. Let's see if I can up. Uh, oh no. Well, looks like this talk is gonna end end early. Using Kix enum, you try to guess Kix transactions, and a bunch of the transactions you hit cause errors. They're called ad ends and fails. Um, these errors get noticed by operations. Those errors aren't normal. And when they see a bunch, obviously you're not in a production kicks environment because otherwise it would be a big deal. But instead they decide to just shut kicks down instead. So I guess we don't really have a choice. We're going to be looking at TSO since kicks is now blocked off from us. All right, let's look at TSO. So using the list of users from the domain, you're going to use an MMAP script called TSO enum. And that script is going to see how many accounts from Windows, from the Windows domain, actually have access to TSO. And the reason you can do this is because uh, in top secret, unless you've turned on the the TSO password pre-prompt setting, it, it's a mouthful, TSO password pre-prompt. 
unless you turn that on, you can enumerate user IDs in TSO. So you type log on Apple ID TSO, hit enter, type in whatever user ID you wanna try, hit enter, and they'll come back and say either enter your password or sorry, that user doesn't have access to TSO. So typically that user doesn't exist. So we'll do, so you do that first. And after doing the enumeration of the thousands of Windows domain accounts you have, you notice that only 20 Windows accounts have TSO access. So they're using the same user ID and the same password on the main thing as they would in the domain. So taking those 20, so now instead of trying to brute force, and the, the, the key thing here is doing that um, typically won't trigger an alarm because you're not causing account that invalid accounts. You're just trying an account and it says, sorry, that account doesn't exist, right? It doesn't, you're not brute forcing an account. However, if you try a username and password that doesn't exist, it will not work. So using those 20 accounts, we run another NMAP script called TSO. See, I told you at the beginning, you really just, for the, for the first bit, you really only need NMAP to break into a mainframe. Now, once you've broken in, you need more. But to get in, you really only need NMAP now. So we use a script called TSO Brute. And for the record, I wrote all these scripts. So I'm not, I'm not just taking someone else's work here. And, and we find a valid user, info s demo demo. So obviously some demo account used for sales or testing or who knows, but there's info s 10 demo demo, or maybe infosec 10, who knows. But here's, here's what it looks like when you run that scan against the mainframe environment. So here we go, whole bunch of accounts tested. And this is how fast it goes, it's, it's, it's really quick. And boom, we, we've got one account. And then that's lucky, at least we got one. So we're gonna try this one account and see what we have access to. We log into demo demo. And the first thing we try to see is see if we can get information about the user plague. Remember way back at the beginning, we wanted to know, can we get information about a user called the plague? Okay, so we'll go back and see if we can do LU plague. So LU is like a who am I, but you can run it against other users so you can see information about that other user. So you type, if you type just LU, it just gives you information about yourself. But since we type LU plague, it should give us information about another user. Instead, it comes back saying that we do not have access to run that command. We can run LU on ourselves, but if we pass it a user ID, we are not allowed to connect and run, well, we're not allowed to run that command against other user IDs. So it looks like the system might be a little more locked down than we anticipated. So it's time to do some enumeration. Everyone's favorite part of the OSCP, it's time to do a whole bunch of enumeration. So you download the tools from this website and we start doing some enumeration. So there's, there's a whole bunch of tools in that toolkit for doing mainframe enumeration, but there's really only three that we're gonna use right now to do our initial uh, enumeration, especially in RACF, the, these three are really, really helpful. So first, enum, then we have another one called search RX and then APF check. So enum is a rec script and it gathers system information about the system that's installed. Now, where's the RACF database being stored? Um, what is my level of access? Because if you're not, like if you can run LU, but you can't see all your statuses in memory. So, because all, all your sort of permissions, like high level permissions are stored in memory when you log in. But you don't have access to it unless you know where to look. This rec script knows where to look. Uh, and the best part about enum is it, it uses memory calls. So it's, it's undetectable. Unless you're catching it as it's coming into your mainframe environment, you're not, you don't see it, right? So it does a whole bunch of checks against memory and then prints it to the screen. Okay, so you can, Search RX uses a RACF command called search. So on search, you can search for all kinds of things and it'll tell you what you, your user has access to on the system. So if you type search, let's see, search facility class, you wanna search the facility class for all the, the profiles that give you um, read access to any, so vpx.star, I think, no, that's Unix. Um, yeah, just surrogate, you're looking in the facility class for any surrogate profiles that you have read access to. That means you can run a job as any user that you have read access to. You might look for Unix cribs in the RACF database to see can you mount a, a, 
a file that runs in Unix on the mainframe. Yes, mainframes have Unix. Mainframes have always come with Unix for about 40 years now and 30 years. And you, you can just run Unix commands in Unix. Right? But you can also mount file systems in Unix. And that means you can mount file systems with your tools with elevated privileges if you have certain permissions and you use search to find those permissions. And then APF check. We don't really delve too much into what APF check is, but you need to know APF is basically, so you have what's called APF libraries. An APF library is a folder. So libraries, on the, now this is a key thing, it took me years to figure this out. A library is a folder on the mainframe. APF check, so if, if you put a compiled binary in an APF authorized library and run it, you will be able to get to ring zero. Okay, I know I'm, I'm dumbing it way down because that's not technically, it's technically called key zero and there's a whole bunch of other things and going to like, it's not supervisor state, there's a whole bunch of stuff, okay? Don't worry about that. Just know it's basically the equivalent of getting ring zero in like a Windows environment. Okay, if you can put a, it's basically like a set UID zero folder where if you can put something in that folder, you now have the ability to execute it with elevated privileges. Okay, that's, that's how we have to, that's how you have to think of it. Okay, so that's APF check. I see votes for, for enum already. Uh, so we upload all our tools to a, a data set, info s10.tools src, right? Because it it's the source, like APF check is a, is a, a thing you need to compile. So we upload our tools to this folder. Now look, it's info s10 dot tools rc. Uh, that is a PDS, so that is a partition data set. You could have uploaded these into non-partition data sets. That would have worked too. But yeah, thanks. Okay, so I already see three votes for enum, and unless someone really runs search rx or apf check uh, and floods the votes with three fake accounts, I'm gonna just go with enum. I don't, I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna, you know, I, I spent a lot of time looking up this Creative Commons sound, so I'm gonna play that anyways while some other votes come in. Okay, I guess, I guess Enum, Enum wins. <laughs> Alrighty, let's take a look at what 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 we get with Enum. So you run the enum script. Now it has a whole bunch of options to pass it. You don't care. You pass it the all command argument and you get all the information dumped to the screen that you want. So here we go. We're gonna run it with the, and this is exactly how you run a rec script, execute, and then the folder, and then the file inside the folder. And then we pass it the argument all, and we get all this information from the system. So we can see all the password settings. We can see, you know, our users being audited, we can see, you know, what we're running the job name, what the password settings are. So are enhanced password settings turned on? Yes or no. What other jobs are running? How many users are on the system? Again, all this is just chilling out in memory. So you, so you get access to it. Uh, all the APF authorized data sets. So now we're looking at, here's all the folders, SVCs. I don't have time to really get into SVCs, but I would recommend that you take a look at uh, Big Endian Small's talk from Black Hat uh, last year, where, or was it two years ago, where he goes through and tells you how to disassemble and find vulnerabilities in SVCs. And it's an amazing talk. I would, I would recommend you go watch that after, like, after the conference so that you can go see uh, like really some like state of the art mainframe hacking happening. So. So we get all this information. Uh, that start one account looks interesting. There is a start one account running. Um, did we already look at it? I don't think so. Oh, well, nothing else really jumps out at that output, for me at least. So we go back. Again, so, so Enum really didn't give us too much information. It's fine, we get dead ends and pen testing all the time. So what should we do next?
Oh, I see, I see a few people typing. So we'll, okay, APF check. APF check, I have two votes for APF check. Unless I see someone start typing soon, I'm gonna assume we're gonna do APF check. All righty, APF check it is. Let's see what happens here. Using JCL included with APF check, that's nice of me. You submit the job, it compiles, automatically runs, and spits the output into SDSF. We don't talk, I mean, we barely talk about SDSF, but SDSF is basically a place for you to see and put an output from jobs. It's not that, it's way more than that, but in the time we have left, I mean, I could give, so in the class that we teach, I could teach like a whole day on SDSF. Like, well, maybe not a day, at least five hours. It is very powerful. So much you could do here. But right now we're looking at the output from the job. So notice we have a job called comp APF in the top that ran, and this is the output. So there's the JES message, right? So that's telling you like what, what happened, what the output looks like. Then you can, there's JES JCL. So JES JCL is what we sent into JES. So JES stands for job entry subsystem, right? So that's, so that's the job controller. When I submit a job, it goes into JES2, and that's called job in. So when you write JCL, that's job control language, and you submit it into your job entry system, which will then process the JCL and do what the JCL tells it to do. And it does it under your ID, under your user ID, unless you have server authority. So um, JES JCL is literally just the JCL that you submitted now. We purposefully put the output here because we want to see it. There's another version of APF check that runs and connects to a listener on Netcat on any, on any IP address. And you can tell it to not save the output in SDSL. So you could run it, it connects on a network port, streams the results to your machine, and then it deletes itself. And because the program compiles itself in a temporary data set, it never actually exists to the compiled version. Now the code obviously exists on disk because you have to get it there. But if you delete that, then it's done. All right, so uh, the messages, that's like what did the what did Des have to say about your program? And then we have the steps. So there's there's three steps: uh, assemble, link, and go. So first you assemble the program, then you link it, and then you the go is the execution piece, and that's where our output's gonna be. And that's where our output looks like. So that's it's gonna gather the lists of data, like so it's gonna look for, and again. So the way this works is, is it checks in memory to see what APF authorized libraries exist on the system. So it's not querying anything, it's just asking in memory what data sets exist in, on the system. And that's in memory, everyone's allowed to read it. And then it uses a, a command called rack route to check your access. It's not asking for access, well it's, it basically says, hey, if this user wanted to access this file, what would you say? And it comes back and says, here's your level of access, okay? And, and depending on your settings and depending on your audit settings, it may or may not trigger alerts. That's what we do it this way. There's other ways you could have done this. You could have just tried to edit them all. That should drive alerts. But this, this is the quietest way to do it. So we scroll through the whole list and look at that at the very bottom. Someone has some old library sitting out there that this user has update access to. There's three levels of access. There's read, update, and, uh, and uh, oh shoot, I can't remember the, the third one. Um, it's not update, it's, it's higher than update. But basically it means you can delete the file. So update essentially means we can add stuff to it, we just can't delete it. So we have APF authorization. So we're going to write a simple, simple, simple high level assembler program and we're going to compile it and place it under the name IOECM. There, it's, um, the re we pick IOECM for a very specific reason and that's because it's part of TSO auth. Uh, that gets, we get, now we're getting into the super weeds. Assume that you are a, a mainframe super hacker and know why it's IOECM or I'll leave it up to the chat to tell me why they think it's IOECM, but that's what it's gotta be. It could be anything in TSO auth, but it's gotta be it's got to be that one of those. And so we just pick one that we're going to run it as. Now, what this program does is when you run it, it's going to basically, so, so when you log into the mainframe, you get 
your user ID is like your user information of the ACE block is shoved into memory in your virtual address space. And then you continue to log it. And then when you do stuff, the operating system queries that location and memory for things like what your user ID is, what level of access you have at a high level. Are you system operator? Are you system programmer? That kind of thing. Um, so what? So if I say was able to become a IBM user, like that's the master user in RackF by default, or IBM Sys1, then I could do whatever I want on the system because I have you know, full control of the RackF database. And it's only querying your user ID and memory. I'm sure it's doing a lot more than that, but you copy the whole memory region of the program. So what this program does is it basically overwrites that region of memory for you and says, now you're this new user. It's exactly the same like changing your effective user ID in Unix. So if you say, for example, you know you can create a set UID program in, in, in Linux, you create a super simple C program that changes your effective UID to zero and your user ID, you, and your UID to zero, you run it and now you're running as UID zero. It's the same thing except you just give it a, a username. And the way this works is because it's APF authorized, you don't need to supply a password. So you run this, this, this macro called rack route, you don't give it a password, and then all of a sudden now you're running as the user that you want to reverse power with. Now, the challenges are because you've done this, now you saw me in that text editor, you saw me in SDSF, because we're doing this like trickery within TSO, we don't actually have the capabilities to like edit a file, to launch ISPF, that it's really limited. So you upload a really simple program written in Rex called cat. It's a super simple Rex script. There's instructions online how to do it all over the place. You write a super simple Rex script called cat and upload that to a place where you know that you can run it so that when you do change your user ID, you can execute this script to actually look at files. Because right? otherwise you can't really do, you can move files around and stuff. Um, in fact, another way, if, if we had more time, in a, in, a, in a virtual session like this, what you could have done is you could copy any file that you want into your HLQ. That's the first, uh, that's the first part of your username. If a file starts with your username on the mainframe, you have access to it no matter what the system says, right? That's the first thing it checks. Does your file, does the file start with your user ID? Is it user ID dot, then you have access to it. So if you can copy stuff to your user ID, you can read it no matter what but it's being able to do that that gets challenging. So we're just gonna use cat because it's easier for, for this. So here we go. So we're gonna log in as our user, info S10. We have access to nothing. It's just a demo account, but it can, so we're going to try to execute this program and look up this garbage file that we were told that we need to look at. We don't have access to that file, obviously, right? So info set cat, our, our cat tool, bombs out you don't have access. So now we're gonna call our APF authorized program. And now we're running as our target user. So we're the user of the plague, we have access to whatever we want. Now because it starts with the plague user ID, we can see the contents of this file. And we can see that it's some kind of maybe bank account and a amount followed by the line number. Great, we did it. Good job, team. So we found the evidence that we were looking for. So we package up all that account, we take that account file, that garbage file that we found, we package it up, and it's super easy to move things off. I mean, you could just screen record if you wanted to. Uh, we close our laptop and we leave the coffee shop that we were hiding out in to do all this sweet mainframe hacking. The next day, So you decide that you're gonna watch a show on HBO and you're gonna actually watch it live. And all of a sudden, the signal cuts out, the screen goes dark and it's replaced by some teenager. And you recognize the screen, the number that's on the bottom of the screen from the very file that you sent to Razor the day before. Okay, so we did it. We were able to hack the mainframe. Um, we only 
had them shut off kicks. So I'm sure, I'm sure they're going to come looking for us because frankly, uh, having that many kicks of bends, they will find you eventually because they'll want to find who to yell at for causing that much problems. But we did it. Congratulations, everyone. Uh, thank you for playing. Normally, I w at this point, um, since we bombed out on kicks, does anybody want to see the, the other path for kicks? Instead of, so we got, I got about five minutes to go here. Um, does anybody want to see, see that, uh, that other kick side? Instead of, uh, otherwise I can just go. Yeah, Hoop, Hoop says they want to see it. Um, one vote, good enough for me. That's, uh, that's, oh, I should play, should I play my 14 second leg, leg sound here? Here, I'll give everyone else some. It doesn't matter, I got, I got enough. I got enough replies here to go through it. Holy moly, my, oh, my screen stopped sharing. Let me, um, let me not, I don't want to spoil it. So I'm going to, I'm going to go back to, to, to the kicks part. Let's see here. Um, I mean, there's so many things you could have done here, but instead, let's see here. Okay. Let me, let me go back and, and share my screen again. Just so I don't, I don't want to spoil anything here. So, so 3270 takes us, okay, so we did 3270. We talk about doing our port scans. We talk about doing all of our fun stuff, right? And then we have a choice to make. Okay, so we, oops, let's assume. So we did VTAM and we find a bunch of applications running, right? TSO kicks, and these you're gonna find almost everywhere. Like I, I would, I would be shocked if you don't find a kicks transact, like a kicks region running on a mainframe. Okay, so, okay, we're back, a kicks. So we talked, we looked, now we have a choice. Do we want to do enum or brute? And who, who remembers what we did last time? Did we do enumeration? Did we do account enumeration or did we do, or sorry, transaction enumeration, I should say, um, or did we do brute? I would remember. Yes, you got you. That's exactly right. So you did. Uh, the answer was enumeration. So we tried to enumerate the kicks transaction. Now remember what I said. In kicks, it's like a proto web server. You have transactions. Transactions are four characters long. So you can enumerate that address space very quickly. However, if you do that, you can cause abends. If you don't have, especially if you don't have access to the transaction, you will cause errors, and someone will see those errors typically. I mean, they might not, like maybe they're, you know, maybe you're on some dev region and no one cares. But typically if they see that many. Okay, so using the kicks user brute script, uh, we find that 10 accounts had access to kicks. That's good. That's, that's less than the 20. So manually using 3270, we check to see which of those accounts have access to a transaction called CEMT. Now CEMT is basically the PHP info of kicks. If you can act, now it's way more than that again, but I only have like five minutes left. So CMT is basically the, the PHP info. So we, we run an MMAP script called CMT info, and that's going to, to gather information using CMT. Now it's obviously not like PHP info where it's in one nice screen. It's all over the place. And so you can see the script is running specific CMT commands to gather information from kicks and then it just spits it out all into MMAP. So if you're running this as part of a script, you can dump this to XML and then put it into whatever I mean, automation that you want. So these are all the transactions. So remember before where we like, we would just try random transactions and hope they work. Well, now we know what transactions exist on this system. Um, oh, and looking at the output, we see that CEDA is enabled. CEDA is a transaction that allows you to add, remove, change, do all kinds of stuff within kicks okay but depending on the configuration it allows you to submit jcl and there's a tool that that, that exists to do that called kickspone i saw someone in the chat already posted kickspone so you clone the kickspone repo we run it again on our kicks region knowing that we have access 
Um, oh, and I have to say this, the Kickspone was a tool written by IU. It's fantastic. Um, if you can use it today, use it. I think we, we have, the Mainframe Hacker Society has a repo that will, um, I think, fix some of the challenges. But it's basically a local file include vault. So what, how this works is it uploads a file and then tells Kicks to call it, basically. So we run it. And you can see here that we're going to get a, a reverse shell. So, so Kickspone is running using a Kicks local file include vulnerability. And it's going to create, it's actually going to create a bind shell. So it's going to create a bind shell running on port 4445. And we're going to connect in with MCAT on that port. And there we go. Now we have a TSO account and looks like we're running as, let's see, what user are we here? Anyone want to tell me? Oh, we're running as user start one. Interesting. We look at the user ID, you look at the user ID and see you're running as start one. Uh, you try creating a new user with this command, but you get denied. Uh, this shell is, is really limited. Doing anything in that environment is, is really a pain. Um, and then looking around further, you see that this account is also locked out. So looks like Kicks was a dead end, another dead end. So you decide to instead take a look at TSO, and that was the path we took. Um, and with that, let's see here. With that, I'll say I'll say thank you, thank you for having me. This um, this was a great opportunity. Uh, I think you're reached out to see if I could do this. This is um, true. absolutely. Do you want this? So thank you what for you having need? me. I really appreciate Just a. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll be in the chat. Yeah. To Ooh, take any questions.